Good morning, Wellspring. Just uh, grateful for you guys to be joining us this week. We were sitting around talking this morning, trying to remember exactly how many weeks it's been like this. We think that this is the fifth Sunday uh, that we've been doing this uh, Facebook Live format here. So definitely becoming a pattern, but not obviously what we'd like it to be ultimately. We really miss you guys and have loved getting the opportunity just to text back and forth with some of you guys or bumping into people at the grocery store once in a while. Um, it's always fun to see a familiar face uh, when we can. So just wanted to give you a couple uh, different uh, reminders this morning. One, and I've emailed this out, but if there's some folks that are watching that, that aren't a part of our church normally or um, you know just aren't getting emails, just really want to remind you that, that as a church, we would really love to be kind of known for our generosity during this time. So I've been really encouraging and challenging everybody there that maybe they got a, a stimulus check in the mail or they got a, a tax refund this year that, that they would consider giving some of that money away to benefit and help and come alongside other families in our community that, um, that might be struggling during this time economically because of different factors, loss of job, whatever it might be. But also trying to think about uh, being... Uh, aware of some of the ministries in town that rely on donations, non-for-profits that maybe we could kind of step in and help fund. So please just continue to be generous. We had a great uh, march financially, so I just want to say thank, thank you to the faithful families that continued to give. Um, that was just an awesome reminder of how you guys are invested in this community and in it with us. So great job. Uh, Steve has put a tab up on our screen there that you can go to if you want to, to donate online. Uh, you can do that as well. So this week is going to be a little bit different. We're taking a break from a normal sermon series to, to share a few stories this week. Um, I was looking uh, back on a verse that I've looked at quite a bit. It's from Galatians 6.15, and it talks about what matters or what counts is a new creation or a changed life. And the whole point of what we do here at Wellspring um, is to communicate the gospel to folks, hopefully in a way that it actually brings about transformation in their lives. It is not just a gathering of information about God, but they t people take that in and begin to make changes in their life. And so we've been talking about that a lot this semester with our, our two sermon series. So we want to kind of take a break today introduce you to a couple of people who I know have kind of been working on um, some things in their life. And um, we talked last week about the resurrection and the whole beauty of the resurrection of what it provides us as followers of Christ is the Holy Spirit in our life, giving us the power to become the people that God has always seen us as, uh, as we look back at our last sermon series, that we're maturing into who we already are. And so watching that maturation process in people's faith as they grow and deepen their dependence on God, and then that begins to express itself in greater acts of love um, towards uh, other people in their life, their spouse, their friends, their kids, their teammates, whoever it might be, is, is one of the funnest things that I get to do as a pastor is come alongside and be um, a spectator of all that going on. So this past week, I wanted to share with you uh, something that I read. Some of you guys have heard of the, the Enneagram, which is uh, uh, it's kind of a personality um, tool that was created by Christians long ago, centuries ago, um, that really looks at nine different personality types that all humans kind of fit into one of those nine categories. And, um, and so the, the book about the Enneagram that's uh, been pretty recent called The Road Back to You shared this, this quote, and I thought it was so appropriate for all the things that we've been talking about recently here at Wellspring. So this is what the author said. He said, what we don't know about ourselves can and will hurt us, not to mention others. As long as we stay in the dark about how we see the world and the wounds and beliefs that have shaped who we are, we're prisoners of our history. We'll continue going through life on autopilot doing things that hurt and confuse ourselves and everyone around us. Eventually, we become so accustomed to making the same mistakes over and over in our lives that they lull us to sleep. We need to wake up. And today you're going to get to meet some folks who are, are trying to wake up, who have taken a look at maybe some of the wounds that have been handed down to them through life that affected the way they were operating. They begin to address some of those things. We talked about the importance of that, of asking those deeper why questions. So we're going to have some conversations this morning. Uh, we're going to start off uh, with a conversation with Matt Robertson here in a moment. Um, you see Matt a lot uh, down in the, the basement and, and doing the 
the children's ministry stuff on Sunday mornings, making the videos that your kids watch. And so he's a, a great guy who's been at Wellspring for quite a while. His wife, Brittany, obviously is on staff as well. And then we're going to take a break for some worship music kind of in the middle. And then later on, we're going to meet um, Taylor and Blair Kennedy who are going to share a little bit as well. So we're going to start off with Matt this morning. Matt, if you want to come on down and we'll get rolling. Well, thanks for joining us this morning, Matt. I'd love for you just to start off by just giving us all just a little glimpse or a picture of if we were kind of to rewind the tape maybe a year ago, what what things looked like in your life? What were some of the, the broken patterns um, and how you operated personally and then maybe even in your relationship uh, with Brittany at home? And uh, yeah, just give us a, a quick snapshot of what that looked like. Um, well, thanks for having having me here and just get a chance to talk with you this morning and, and just share my story. And yeah, just to answer your question, just what life looked like a year ago, um, I would say that my my life just was marked by a high level of um, shame and isolation. Um, I spent too uh, too much of my efforts just managing the effects of shame and just covering up a lot of stuff in my life. Um, uh, the truth the truth is that um, a year ago I was uh, in the clutches of a 15, 16 year addiction to pornography. Um, and that was something that was uh, really defeating uh, in my life, in my attempt to follow Jesus, in my attempt to be a loving husband. Um, uh, that's where I was just had, I just had very low um, opinion of myself. Um, the visual uh, from the book, The Cure, um, of me standing on one side of my giant pile, um, and then Jesus on the other side, um, with the pile being so big that I can only guess what his face looked like toward me, mm. um, was really uh, was a really a powerful visual, and that's something that I know that I struggle with, just this th- Jesus being unapproachable, um, and that's just something that, that's just how I live my life with, um, just a just a high level of hiding and just um, withdrawing from people um, and ultimately ultimately from God. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's powerful stuff. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you learned about just some of the, the wounds and, and triggers that you maybe carried from your childhood into that time that uh, as you began to kind of wrestle with some of the whys um, kind of came to the surface of awareness for you. Um. I lived, I lived most of my life um, believing the lie that I was a disappointment. Um, I understand that that, um, that started very young. Um, I was a kid, I, I started just, that started very young. I um, had a very hard time connecting with my, with my parents. Um, I, had a hard, I had a hard time dealing with uh, my, my parents' divorce when I was three years old, um, and it just, it was just a really, um, it was just tough for me to bounce back and forth from house to house um, on a daily basis, um, and it just—it was just hard for me. It seemed like my ability to connect with my parents was cut in half, but my responsibility and duty toward them kind of doubled, and mm-hmm. that just put a lot of pressure on me to perform and be somebody that I felt like I needed to be. Um, and I was a kid who rarely got in trouble. But that was really that was just only because I being in trouble terrified me. Um, I was easily I was easily um, embarrassed and easily uh, intimidated by uh, just people and just experiences with my dad just kind of affirmed a belief that he was unapproachable. Um, that I just real I just had some some feelings of fear toward him. Uh, I would. I could expect um, any times of correction to be uh, met with me feeling like I was uh, embarrassed or felt low. Uh, but at the same time, there were many occurrences of um, when I was doing things right, there was a very intense display of affection and delight toward me. So it felt like there was an equation to that to obtain um, some affection um, mm-hmm. from him. Um, and just from people, and that's just how I figured out how I was supposed to operate. Um, and coupled with the, just the fact that I was really left alone a lot as a kid, um, just to just to kind of be by myself, I really learned to be by myself and withdraw. Um, and it seemed like I liked it, but 
um, but in reality, I hated it. I hated to feel lonely. Um, but it just seemed like I kind of adapted to that that way of life, and I became an introvert, um, so so to speak. Um, and I liked being alone, but I really didn't. I really struggled with um, dealing with some frustrations and lies of um, having just low self-esteem and having uh, poor body image. I always felt like I was um, as a as a kid and teenager, I was noticeably overweight and just awkward. Um, so it was just really tough for me to navigate all that alone. Um, I could expect my mom to be gone a whole lot during, for business trips and things like that. Um, so I just struggled with a sense of loneliness and um, I didn't like to be alone, but I learned to do that. Um, at the same time, I was really desperate for people's affection uh, and desperate for people's attention and um, affirmation. So I learned ways to do that. Um, I found the mo one of the most profound ways was in sports, where you could stand here, do this, perform this way, and you get cheered. Um, and that, that was the first thing that I, that I, I found, but it wasn't the last. Um, I found more and more masks to put on, um, artistic talents, whether it be, and then um, just trying to double down on things that I thought people would want to see from me. Uh, but one of the most, uh, powerful statements from the uh, book The Cure was nobody told me that when I wear a mask it is the mask that receives love mm. and that was um, that was hard to uh, hard to hear and um, hard just hard to see and experience um, and sadly that that way of living just that, that those patterns carried into adult life they carried into uh, me becoming a Christian and how I viewed God um, as a performance-based um, relationship and uh, how I entered into marriage. And I was so easily uh, willing to just withdraw from conflict and just admit that I was a disappointment and I was wrong. I, I'm the bad one. And, um, yeah, so... <laughs> what would become like, and in your marriage relationship, what were some triggers that would happen that would kind of take you back to your, your wounds and your way of operating? Um, and so, yeah, sadly, um, my perception of somebody being intimidating and un unapproachable, that got transferred to Brittany, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, so anytime that I felt like I was, I failed in an area, that meant that I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And as an adult navigating those feelings, it just makes <laughs> it just it doesn't it just uh, it doesn't work. Um, um, and I have known that in my pattern of isolation, uh, I was you know I was first um, shown pornography when I was six years old. So I was I knew from an early age that that was a place where I could go to numb uh, feelings and to um, get so, get some sort of affirmation. So. Um, really withdrawing from hard things, um, I would always just feel bad about myself and then know that I can feel better. <laughs> so with, yeah. with, with numbing um, behaviors and things like that. So in your marriage, did that uh, translate itself into <clears throat> like the way you guys navigated conflict, um, not being able to, to get through those things in healthy ways? Um, you know, the, yeah, just maybe how some of those wounds kind of manifested themselves in where you were kind of getting stuck. Mm -hmm. Can you think through that a little bit? Or Yeah. Um, I would, there seemed to be a, just a, a predictable script mm -hmm. of how we handled conflict. And it was 99% of the time just ended with me saying, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Like, and really me trying to double down on promises that I will, I'll be better. It's kind of like, I'll be like you <laughs> mm. almost. Um, cause I'm the bad one. You're the good one. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's just where I was stuck mm. and we didn't really have the ability to grow in that when, um, someone, I was just kind of imprisoned in this feeling of being, being a disappointment to her. Gotcha. So what then became some of the turning points for you in this past year? What were some of the big landmarks you think that, that really helped you move forward in some new ways or come to terms with some of those wounds and triggers that gave you some understanding of, uh, hey, here's, here's a way through this? Um, so the, the important people in my life, um, 
Brittany and close friends, they knew um, that I had a kind of a lifelong struggle with pornography. Um, after many failed attempts of sobriety, um, it it brought me to a place where I could only trust secrecy, and I couldn't. And I was just frustrated by um, just the lack of freedom. Um, so I got to a in that. So I was in a place where you know I felt like I couldn't be open. Um, I felt like I was just scared of being found out, um, but I desperately wanted to be known. Um, but I was just, so, I was very just frightened of being, being exposed. And that did mean that I had to, that I willingly agreed to lie to my wife. Um, I was at a place where I was not gonna tell anybody at all, um, even the people who cared about me. Um, so un unfortunately, but uh, fortunately, I had to be found out. Like God had to expose those things to Brittany, Brittany and it happened. Like I, the, uh, I, my secret was laid out for her. Um, it was painful. It, um, it, people who know Brittany um, know that she's a very positive, strong person um, and loving, um, but that crushed her. And it just felt like another defeat. Mm. And I was... Just kind of reinforced what you it already was, thought. Yeah, it was a reinforced, just unfortunate cycle that I just felt like, what What can I do? It, mm -hmm. it seemed like it was, it was hopeless. Um, but uh, just... I'm very grateful, very thankful that through the midst of you know days of pain after that, um, that Brittany met me with grace. Um, I I always had the fear of my mistakes are going to result in termination of relationship, and I was just like, that's what that's what that's what scared me. But she leaned into um, she leaned into the tough times of that. Mm. Um, at the same time, something needed something needed to change. I couldn't keep operating this way of, of secrecy, um, and need, and I needed to be known. Like I needed to um, have some sort of wholeness about me, um, and I truly desired freedom, um, but I didn't know how to get it. So, like I was at a place where I was willing to ask questions, <laughs> um, yeah. And I was given the given um, the number of somebody that I that I could call, and I called and I called that person and. I began to meet. I began to meet with just um, a gentleman from uh, church who has a just amazing story of grace in this arena. Um, I started meeting consistently with him, and this is the first time I felt like I was really known. This is the first time I was really um, had somebody check on, like the really the condition of my heart, rather than just helping me stop a bad habit or helping me um, not do something. Um, so that was just a really awesome. Uh, just Can I to, ask you real quick? Yeah. Because I know that you know people get to this place where it's like, um, how scary did that phone call feel, <laughs> or were you just so fed up that you're just like, I, I just need to move on? Like I'm, I'm, I'm over the fear thing. I don't make phone calls. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just, that I, from an early age, I was I, I, I don't I didn't even like order pizza on the phone because like I just like scared to talk to people so yeah it was a very big deal mm. to um to dial that number and to just say hey this is this is hi I'm Matt <laughs> yeah <laughs> so hi um and this is this is what's going on and like mm. it was just really it was just really awesome to uh be invited into just a friendship uh, a friendship with him um and that just made me that did make me hungry for um or the possibility of hope and and actual uh, freedom freedom from pornography. So that did um, inspire a just a thirst and a hunger for you know putting healthy things in my life. Mm -hmm. I did uh, take seriously making sure that I felt safe um, with technology and opportunity in my life. So that was really awesome. Um, but on the on the positive side, on the um, moving forward to something better, uh, I was really directed toward. Um, just my true desire. It's like, and through meeting through meeting with this uh, this gentleman, is just I was really it was really cool to to have him direct me to the truth. Is that my my real desire was to have connection. My real desire was to just to connect deeply with God and to connect deeply with my wife and to connect deeply with people. Um, and pornography and shame was something that was keeping me from doing that. 
Um, so that just made me hungry. That made me um, really desire the po- some positive things in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, so diving into um, books and listening to podcasts and, uh, and just developing some resources that really were helpful in my life, that just brought healthy and life-giving truths. Really awesome. Uh, one, uh, one activity that I was able to participate in was finding my why. Like, why on earth would I want to be free from this powerful coping mechanism that I've learned to trust in my life? Why? Why would you want to do that? Um, Because I was so convinced that freedom was only to, my freedom from this was only to benefit other people. It's like um, other people would be, um, other people deserved for me to have sobriety and to have freedom from this. Mm -hmm. But through doing that, I I found out that I deserved (laughs) to be free. Yeah, which was a new concept, a new mm. idea, um, which was powerful, um, and just my why had to address that feeling of being a uh, feeling like a disappointment. So I was able to do an exercise where I wrote it out, and that was powerful. So mm. I wrote, I had to write out the words, "I'm sick and tired of feeling like a disappointment. I want real love and connection with with mm. God and people." Yeah, that was big. That's awesome, man. I mean, as I'm sitting here listening to this, I'm thinking through like. Really, one of the only one of the reasons why people stay in hiding is because there's not a culture of safety around them. You know, they're either not married to somebody or in friendships with people who feel safe um, to to come out and share. Here's my brokenness. Here's my wound. Or they're not in a a the church community. You're not connected church at all. Um, to where those kinds of values of taking the mask off and and receiving grace and all those things are there. So I think that's why, you know, as a church, we're striving so hard to create a place for people to feel safe enough to come out, you know, and and to say, gosh, here's here's my stuff, and I'm tired of living like this, so that you can be free. So that's awesome. And I was just also thinking just about how the enemy builds up this anticipation of what talking with somebody or admitting what your struggle is, is going to be like. And most of the time we find out that it's much different than that. And once it's out there and there's been some grace received, it is like this load has just been lifted and the momentum just becomes really quick in in chasing this newfound freedom that you have. So that's really encouraging that, that you were met with those things and provided with some people who are willing to walk. So tell me, um, a little bit about, just as we kind of finish up your story here, we're going to, um, actually, you kind of answered two questions in one there. Um, is there anything to add to, I guess, how those changes have impacted kind of the way that you are navigating life now? Uh, yeah, through, throughout the course of recovery and um, experiencing some victory, um, I, so, something, something started happening that I didn't expect. I started to feel. Mm. <laughs> um, and that was something very strange to me um because i was so used to numbing my whole life um that having to actually experience emotions was a whole nother just a whole nother realm um and not all of those uh, emotions were welcomed like i for the first time i had to um address anger and frustration um shame and i had to learn how to handle that in a, a more healthy way of uh, being vulnerable and relying on relationships as opposed to relying on a substance um, and going to um, numbing behaviors. Um, so that was, uh, that was really uh, a big turning point to be able to communicate powerful emotions with people um, and to be vulnerable. Um, that's just something that wasn't on the table ever. Um, so that was big. And just... Um, Throughout, just to continue that, um, I figured I, I understood that you know I, I tend to get overwhelmed by a whole lot of stuff um, really easily, uh, and just understanding and navigating my relationship with shame was something that was just really overwhelming to me to kind of understand the deep why and just my relationship with shame. And through the course of the Mind of Christ class, the book The Cure. Um, uh, this this sermon series and another book I'm going that I that I went through that addresses the specifics of uh, your sexual brokenness just let me know it it sh- it shown it sh- um, light was shown on just how much work needed to be done and how much was needed to be just excavated in my story and my relationship with shame um, and it was overwhelming it mm-hmm. seemed like 
this is just too much. Yeah. Um, but by the grace of God, I was just invited into um, to proceed and to, invited to uh, to continue to um, to dive into my my whys and my relationship with shame with with kindness and curiosity. Mm. Um, and that was just a, just a really big thing for me. Yeah. Well, last thing, uh, what, what advice would you give um, a young person, a young married couple, or really anybody that's on a journey where they're, um, you know, just feeling stuck, trapped in, in old patterns, having a hard time breaking out maybe of that, that pleasing God narrative um, that they've lived in? Uh, what advice would you give to folks? Yeah. Um, if, you're, if your story is anything like me, uh, like mine, and you have a uh, You've struggled with the same things. You're probably used to shame being the the biggest bad, baddest thing in your life that you've tried to flee from your entire life, only to be chased down and um, just made to be made to f- feel hopeless once again. Um, I've I've received a lot of encouragement by changing that narrative of instead of fleeing from shame, kind of turning toward. Um, Shame and start asking questions, mm. um, and we get the amazing invitation from Jesus to to turn toward our story of brokenness and um, to give our just and to treat ourselves with kindness and um, and to explore with curiosity. and the, And a lot of times, the sad thing is you're going to meet things that are are worth mourning. Um, that are painful, um, but the promise that God gives us in His grace is that uh, just from His words, and blessed are the ones who mourn because they will, they will be comforted. I think people who struggle with shame and struggle with addiction or any sort of thing that they're trying to make sense of their life and cope, we're just looking for a sense of comfort, a sense of rest. And Jesus promises to give us, give us that, but we don't even take the time to really call out what is. What is really painful? What was actually lost in my life um, that I just feel sadness for? Um, so diving into a sto- your story has been, um, diving into my story has just been really profound. Um, and just for anybody who does have that, that, um, that story, my, I, I couldn't say this um, a year ago, but if you do have that story, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> so that's, that's my advice. Like, phone call. Yes, I, like a phone call. <laughs> so like, I, would, like, I would actually enjoy talking to somebody who has that story. Um, that part of my journey has been something that has been another, another thing that I did not expect. Um, my desire for people um, and my desire for, uh, for connection with people has, um, has become a place where I feel like um, I, I, I can know uh, men who have this struggle and people can know me. Um, there is now uh, me, meeting, me meeting with my kind of mentor has uh, formed into a group here at church for men who uh, are seeking freedom from uh, sexual brokenness. And I've been, I just had the, just the amazing opportunity to be surrounded by men who are um, desiring freedom and learning to be vulnerable and showing their strength that way. Um, so that's just been really cool. So I do like talking to people now. So if that's um, if that's their story and they struggle with the same thing that I struggle with, um, shame. The the script of shame is shut up, stop asking questions. Um, but the voice, the gracious voice of God says, proceed, keep going, call somebody. Um, you want to be known. You want to be heard. Um, and that's that's a pretty cool thing that uh, God has used me to be able to do is to talk with people um, and just start friendships. That's been really cool. I kind of set out to stop an unwanted behavior, but I to get rid of an unwanted behavior, but I got friends, mm. which is a very um, kind of a curveball of grace, and that was yeah. really cool. That's awesome. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate your honesty, your willingness to come and share um, difficult things. So if you guys are, are watching at home, you know, you can imagine um, just how tough it is to, to bring this stuff to light. Um, and so any encouragement you can uh, send Matt's way, just shoot him a text, give him a call. Um, he's, he can be your phone friend now. Um, and I think just one thing that I want to share too is that um, we need to understand that really you can insert any 
any wound or um, sin pattern in the blank there. Um, so Matt's process of change isn't just strictly towards his particular issue that he's struggling with, but if you want to know about just change in general um, for any issue that you might have, Matt is uh, somebody that's taken his healing seriously, one of many, uh, and we get to highlight him today though. So um, awesome job. We're going to take a break to do some worship and we'll come back with our next interview in just a little bit. Praise, hallelujah to thee, hallelujah, for death has lost its grip on me. Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we are here uh, joined uh, with uh, Taylor and Blair Kennedy. Um, just trying to figure out that they've been married about uh, six and a half years, I think, if we're doing the math right. Um, but I already have three kids, so their life at home is crazy. A lot of uh, Wellspring folks can probably relate to what that is like. Um, so thank you guys for being here. Uh, we're just going to talk a lot of the kind of similar things that we did with Matt here this morning. We'd like to just start with just a little bit of a background of if we were to rewind the tape uh, back a year ago, um, what were some of the, the normals for you guys at home that as you look back now, you could say, man, that was, that was kind of a broken pattern we were in or a place where we were kind of stuck. And so how would you describe a year ago when you're all married in life? Um, so honestly, I would prefer not to rewind that tape and to go back to those places because we had a whole lot of conflict um, just nonstop. We, and Taylor and I both fight back with each other. So our conflict was really nasty and really ugly. Um, and then so we would have fights with screaming, yelling, ang physical anger, um, a lot of really hurtful things said to each other. And then we would try and resolve it. So we'd have a fight on Tuesday, not talk to each other, try and resolve it on Thursday, get in another really big, huge fight try again on Saturday, and then just give up. Hmm. So then by Sunday... You're we'll, ready for church, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 but then we were like, okay, we'll just try again. And then we would do it again. Mm -hmm. Again and again and again. A lot of no forgiveness. Um, not a lot of grace for each other. When we honestly, like when we would try and resolve conflict, we would ask each other, or we would just tell each other, well, you did this. You did this. He'd come back at me. You did this. We didn't have a language, and we just didn't know why we were hurting each other so bad. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a lot of hopelessness a year ago. So, as you guys started to kind of look into some of your wounds and triggers, um, what did you guys begin to discover about that maybe gave you some insight into why you operated the way you did? Um, I would say... If you were to ask me a year ago, I don't know if I could have probably have told you what my triggers and what my wounds were, but um, after uh, going through some just extensive and, and painful counseling, um, I have a much better grip on what those things are. So to kind of speak to the trigger first, um, I started realizing that whenever, whenever she would have like a weak moment and maybe it would come through um, by disrespecting me or where I felt disrespected or just kind of felt incompetent, I would always respond with inflicting hurt on her. Mm -hmm. So I just, <clears throat> it was a very natural process for me. It's like um, as soon as I felt offended, I wanted to make sure she felt that same hurt. And the wound that I um, realized that that kind of stern from was just, as a child, where I kind of went through some abuse, um, I was kind of put into a position of vulnerability, but I didn't have the ability to defend myself. Mm. 
And so, I mean, that would have never even occurred to me, right? So as that cultivated and kind of grew life, as a man, I made sure that, okay, well, now I have the ability to defend myself, even if that was my bride. Instinctively, I made sure I did that. Wow. And yeah, that came through hurting her. Was that a realization that, that, that you came to through counseling? Yeah, so through... Mm -hmm. uh, just through some painfulness and through peeling back a whole bunch of layers. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's no way I would have came to that realization on my own, unfortunately. But, yeah, God used um, counseling to kind of bring, bring life to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was going through my mind is that this thing that we talk about here sometimes that wounded pe or hurting people hurt people. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, because you just don't know. If you don't know the why, then you're just living out of reaction, whatever yep. is going to alleviate the pain or, or inflict the pain. <laughs> well, so. and I always just thought I dealt with that with just assuming, hey, I'm just a guy that has anger. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm just like a kind of a hothead. Right. And that's where it stopped. Gotcha. So. Yeah. Yeah. Blair, you want to add, add to that just from your own perspective, the things you, you know you struggled with and some triggers that you had as well? Um, so I think that a trigger for me was anytime Taylor would leave in a fight. And so anytime we had a big blow up, he would leave. And that was almost all of our fights because we didn't know how to fight nice or yeah, it, we just fought really ugly. And so anytime he left when he was just too angry or just needed to leave, um, I fought back really, really bad. So I would just start yelling at Taylor and just telling him that he was worthless or telling him that he couldn't take care of our family. Just really painful things. I would just scream at him because in a really twisted way, I just wanted him to stay. So even if we were fighting, that was better than him leaving me. Mm. And so that stems back to just, um, just I think... A lot of things, I mean, just times of feeling left out and feeling unwanted in my life. So whether, whether that was just being unwanted or feeling that way with my family, or even just being a twin, that brings on those feelings. So if my sister, in a certain aspect, was a better athlete or had more friends, I would just always feel alone in that, just watching her get um, praise for something that I didn't. Yeah. So I always felt really alone in that. And then <laughs> even just childhood and adolescence, um, a few times of just being told that I couldn't be a part of a friend group anymore. So just being denied that. And then um, I think just being intentionally left out of things was always really painful for me. Um, just not getting invited to stuff. So just feeling alone in my thoughts I, with Taylor, I would do anything to not feel that, but I had to so many times because our fights were so nasty. So that was the wound that I'm still in the process of dealing with, um, but the trigger was always him leaving, which we joke, like, we match up perfectly. The things that he had to do were my triggers, back to wounds, and the things that I did to him took him back to his wounds, and it's just crazy because we had no idea when this was going on that th that's why it was going on. We just yeah. thought, wow, this is marriage. We are just stuck, mm. you know. So if you had to, like, put into words <clears throat> the emotions um, that, that not knowing a way through, where did that take you? Like, were you just like, this is just as good as it's going to get? This is just the way it's always going to be? Like, what, what kind of thoughts did you have? We talked about, like, what's this, what was the story you were telling yourself about what the next 20 years of your marriage is going to look like? So, I think Taylor could share, but I think he just sat in shame a lot. Mm. So, he would just sit in shame, sit in shame, and then try and, like, scratch his way out of it. But then we'd fight again, so he'd come right back to the shame. Um, I think for me, it was that whole thought of, like, you know, people saying 20 years into marriage, like, wow, I love them more. I, we're closer to each other. We have all of these, whatever, fill in the blah, blah, blah blanks <laughs> of whatever that looks like. But I was like, man, we are just never going to experience that. We're both just too broken, and we just fight too hard to have freedom here. Yeah. Um, I think that was definitely a big lie. 
that I sat in. Yeah, what it makes me think of is, is you know, when you are desperate to change, but you don't know the why. We've talked about that example of like, it's just kind of like pulling off the weed at the surface level. You know, it's that, that sin management. I'm just going to be better. You know, next time we get in an argument, I'm not going to go there. But when you haven't dealt with what's fueling it, um, you're putting the water on the wrong thing. You know, you're putting out the wrong fire or, you know, or maybe you're not dealing with it at a deep enough level. You're, you're bringing a, a water gun to a, to a house fire, you know, and so... Yeah, man, that's that's hard. It's, and I, but I think it's good for everybody here to kind of get in touch with the desperation that was there, you know. Um, then you've got a, a house full of kids too, you know. And so there's lots of uh, pressures and stresses on top of all those things. So walk us through some of the turning points for you then in the, in the past year. What began to kind of click and start to make sense? You've already mentioned counseling being one of those things, but were there some other things that were helpful as well? Yeah, so... Um... I think what finally got me to a turning point was what you just mentioned, okay? I was, I mean, I was so sick of feeling hopeless because mm. it was like, I swear in my head, I thought I was doing everything that I could, but that was kind of the issue. I didn't know the why, so I was white knuckling a lot, and it did not give me any freedom, and it kept me in a pretty dark place. So I think I just arrived at a place that like hopelessness a bit, and I was really getting sick of it. Um, but God's grace always shows up, right? Even in the, in the ways that we don't think it would. And so the timing of it, I, I can see how God's timing's perfect because at the time where I probably felt the most defeated was also a good timing for um, like men's encounter happened, um, which was really started kind of, it's what made the ball start rolling. Because for one, I started realizing that there's other men out there Um, that kind of feel the same way I do um, within marriage or within other um, parts of their life. And I think just the reassurance of the gospel of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like feeling shameful, but just continuing to hear, hey, I don't have to be. Even if I didn't know why yet, Mm -hmm. that was a real important truth for me to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gave me some hope and to see see others that had come to the other side. It's like, yeah. okay, well, well, they've arrived, right? They've received this thing, so maybe it is attainable for me. Mm. Um, and even, even men in my small group, um, there was some real good healing with that. But I think once I, once I had men's encounter, and then once I kind of hit bottom, um, the next thing that spurred me on was, was counseling. Okay. But I got to be honest, if I didn't have um, people that loved me around me, other like-minded men that were kind of serious about Jesus, mm-hmm. um, there's no way I would have took the ownership to even consider counseling or bringing this to surface. Yeah, so the courage of the pack <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of really. put wind in your sails to, yep. to get moving. So. Yep, courage of the pack for sure. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, Matt, who was just up here, yeah. he's part of my, my small group. And there were, there were men like that, um, that I was able to see and to hear and to talk with that, yeah, gave me a lot of courage. Great, good. Mm-hmm. Blair, what about you? Some turning points for you in the past year, what would you say? Yeah, um, I think coming on staff was huge. Uh, like, I think I officially was on staff in August, so that was like the beginning of all of it, because I was asked questions that I think I'd never really had to think about before. Um, and then before you had done the series for everybody else on The Cure, we started reading that in staff. And silly enough, the very front of the book says, what if God isn't who you think he is and neither are you? That's it for me. Like, I read this book and I thought, wow, I had this totally different picture of God. So like to expand on that, um, I really functioned out of, okay, I'm insecure, I'm disrespectful, like in my Christian walk, okay, I'm these things, how do I be less insecure? Okay, well, I just read my Bible. How do I be less disrespectful to him? Well, I just think about how he is to me. Just like these performance-based ideas. Um, And then I read this book that told me that no matter what you do, the moment after you sin, you are still righteous. When you are sinning, you are righteous. You are cherished. You are chosen. And that was, oh, man. I, I kept saying, like, I can't even get to the whole pleasing, trusting God because I got to sit here. I need to sit here and believe that 
the God of the universe wants to talk to me. Mm-hmm. He wants to know me. He wants to choose me as his beloved. Um, and that really spurred me on and just ignited this piece of my identity that I never really knew existed. Um, so that was really big. And then, like, same as Taylor, I think community was really big because we went a very long part of our marriage not really having to tell anybody about these fights. Um because it was just easier, it was too embarrassing. Nobody else is like that, so mm. why would we say anything? Um, and then, so I think having community and being able to share some of these things with people and then in turn have them encourage us, love us, even when they saw the nastiest parts of who we were, oh, that was really, really powerful, mm. really powerful for us. Yeah, that's so good, and I mean... I think just that um, making sure you've got the right perspective on on who God is and what his nature is towards you and just, you know, you can be, like we talked about, you can be doing all the right Christian things, but if you don't have a proper lens of who God is and who you are and who the people around you are, right? That Taylor's not the enemy, that Blair's not the enemy, but there's an enemy, Satan, who's, who's using every wound in your life that he can to keep you stuck in places where in bitterness and lack of forgiveness um, to just perpetuate this broken cycle so that you don't heal and so that you're, you know, you guys don't get the benefit of, of a great marriage and the things that God intended, but then you're also, you know, your kids are a part of that. And, you know, I mean, I know you've shared with me and times just like, you know, I'm, I'm doing and saying these things and the kids are just sitting here watching this. And that's just, that's hurtful. And we've all experienced that. A lot of us have grown up in homes where there was all kinds of chaos and fighting. It's just like, you know, you're, you can't not be affected by that stuff. And, um, so awesome. I mean, so proud of you guys for that stuff. But, um, so, Let's fast forward the tape then now to today. So if you guys were to talk through, so same scenario, you know, because it doesn't, you know, especially in chaotic homes with young kids, you still have arguments and fights, right? So what does it look different? How does it look differently now to navigate those times compared to a year ago? Um, <clears throat> yeah, you had me getting emotional when you, when you were talking about kids, you know, because mm. they're collateral damage for sure, but as long as I just wanted to keep changing so that they wouldn't have to see it, that never really worked, you know, yeah. so. Um, so kind of how we operate now, it's a little different. Well, it's a lot different. Um, I mean, this is all still a process, right? Yeah. So we're not like skipping out of here and like hugging each other forever. Like it's still tough, but we do operate different um, because of like the best way I experience God's grace, I think like the best way I can say it is I was able to feel his heart hurt for me mm. and that he's here for me. Um, so that kind of, in a way, um, is projected onto her when it's, when it's going well, right? Um, so like a, a quick story I have for this. Uh, a couple weeks ago, she was making some dinner. She loves, that's like one of, her favorite ways to, to serve us, um, because I love food, right? And she has, she has three boys, so she also tends to put a lot of pressure on herself to show up and make this great dinner. So um, it was like a pasta dish, and she had asked me if I wanted to, she's like, hey, here, try these noodles. Are they done yet? And I was like, no, I don't think they're done yet. Well, long story short, um, totally overcooked them, right? And um, when she realized this, it was all my fault. If I would have just told her, that she had a little bit more time, and it was escalating quickly. She was getting really mad, saying hurtful things, um, was like, I'm done with this dinner. I'm throwing it out. Well, in the past, I would be ready to, to give back to that, right? Because I would be like, she's always blaming me. Everything's always my fault. But God had me in a place to think about how her heart was hurting, yeah. So being in touch a little bit with my wounds and hers, God was able to allow me to see uh, she's kind of feeling insecure right now. Um, she's feeling like she's worthless because she didn't come up with dinner. And that really hurt me for her. So I wasn't, I didn't go to the attack. Instead, I kind of wore it, you know, and I knew it's not who she wanted to be. That's what helped me wear it a little bit. 
better is because I, not, I, I knew this isn't who she wants to be. And then um, we ended up eating the dinner. <laughs> And then, um, you'll eat anything. That's right. I'll eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but what was also cool is she came to repentance faster than ever because it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. So yeah. he was able to give me a spirit of kindness and gentleness with her, who is at times fragile, you know, and it led her quickly, like early in the evening. She's like, man, I'm so sorry, you know, and, and kind of explain to me what I just told you, you know, that, yeah, she did feel insecure in that. So that's kind of how we operate now. Yeah. 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 And what, what was standing out to me was just this idea of when we have these unresolved and sometimes just unknown wounds in us, it makes it very hard for us to see somebody else's perspective, Mm -hmm. right? All we're thinking about is how do we protect ourselves? How do we, you know, so we throw our defenses up and put our masks on and we're shielded because we don't want to feel the pain and the discomfort. And so we're not even thinking at all about the other person's perspective, how they might be hurting or having a bad day so we can show them some grace and it it just becomes so self-consuming. But then when we start to get some understanding, um, it just opens our eyes to be able to see others mm-hmm. <laughs> and to mm-hmm. see things from their perspective. So that's just such a, a helpful transition, obviously. So great job. Blair, what about you? Yeah. Um, so I think just like, yeah, I think Taylor taking his healing seriously and me just knowing stuff about his past but not knowing stuff about his past and how it affected him being able to connect the dots yes. to have how the what, events impact how he acts now. Yes. Yeah. I always thought oh, Taylor just gets angry and I'm the one that receives that end of it. Yeah. But I got to see, oh no, Taylor has really deep hurt in these situations. And so, like he said, just a story with it is um, like two Sundays ago, we watched church with the kids and... <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, Taylor was just getting pretty frustrated. The kids were all over him, fighting, just like putting out fires. Just it was just hard. So he had just said some hurtful things, you know, just had to like get out for a moment. And I realized in that moment, like when he had kind of like went to the bathroom real quick, that I could respond in two ways. I could say something that would be little Taylor, like I had become grown accustomed to for six years because he hurt me, I hurt him, Um, and take him to a place of shame, or I could show him grace in the ways that he just gave an example of how he's been showing me grace. Mm. So it was a really just like strange, because typically it's just instinct. Okay, well, you know, he's being rude, whatever, so I'm just going to fight back. But I just had this thought of like, I don't want him to feel like that. Mm. I know Taylor's story a lot more than I used to. And I don't know if I ever knew how bad he dealt with shame until the past year. And so knowing his story and knowing how quickly he can escalate into unhealthy places of shame, I just thought, man, I'm just going to be here for him. I'm going to tell the kids, hey, guys, Daddy didn't want to say that. Daddy, Daddy's just upset. Let's just give him a minute. He just needs a minute. Where before it would have been, look what Daddy's doing. Daddy, you know, just ridiculous things. And do you feel like your ability to extend that grace in that moment also... Uh, was was growing out of of the grace you you were starting to receive from God about just your own perspective? Yes. So in this process in the past year, um, I've had to deal with just like, how do I forgive Taylor for past hurt? Because we've had so much in the past years. And um, through staff meetings and just like asking really hard questions of like, how do I do this? I realized like, gosh, I just remember one night just writing like two huge pages Um, in my journal of forgiveness, not about Taylor and not about how to forgive him, but all the places that I needed to seek forgiveness from God. Mm. And it was really powerful. Mm. Because again, it it takes that lens out of Mm -hmm. sight of, oh, it's all Taylor. He's the one that shows anger. He's the angry one. Mm. This is, it's not me, it's Taylor. And man, I was just, I was weeping Mm. because I really felt my need for a savior I really felt my need for forgiveness and my need for the love of God. Mm. And so tenfold, like, yes, big time. That's a huge part of it. Reminds me of the Psalm 51, right? Against you and you alone, Lord, have I sinned, Mm -hmm. right? First and foremost, Mm -hmm. it's I haven't received your 
your grace. I've had perspectives about you that are wrong, which has made me then act out in this way. And I've got to get some things right here first (laughs) Mm -hmm. before I can even understand how to extend that forgiveness and grace to others. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So wrapping up, what uh, advice would you guys like to, to give to maybe some young married couples or some, uh, you know, just young people in general or anybody, honestly, it doesn't really matter how old you are. Um, yeah. Um, I would say, you know, first, take your relationship with God seriously. You know, I mean, it's, there's not a lot of freeing things that can happen when we're just kind of going through this with a lukewarmness. Um, and that's, yeah, that produces a lot of nastiness. And then I would say, I feel like any time um, somebody's wanting to overcome something um, with God or get over some hurt, I, I haven't seen a lot of situations where they do that alone. Mm-hmm. Hardly, well, I haven't seen any, you know. Um, so every time I see a victory, God typically, even, even through the Bible, chooses to surround that person with like-minded community. And so um, that's the first thing I would say is just put people around yourself that love you, that you trust, and that are serious about Christ. Um, And then I would also say that uh, a thing that just stuck with me um, through this horror deal and still does is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Um, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Yeah. So in those times of shame, when I just thought like I'm this terrible person um, and how weak I was, I just, it was so reassuring to know God showed up, you know, that's how he can be honored and glorified. Yeah. And when that's we're what, humble. <laughs> yeah. And, and when we're humble, right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's when we can taste freedom and actually kind of be used for him too. You yeah. Know? So that's good. Um, I would say, sounds funny, but it just really came on my heart when I was thinking about this. Don't un- underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit because there were times in our marriage where I wasn't sure we were going to make it out of a fight because um, it was just so painful. It was so painful. And God in the past year has done immeasurably more than we ever asked or imagined. Because on our own, we didn't know what to ask. And we didn't even know that things could be different. Mm. So saying that, be brave and courageous and know, like, inviting these battles. Because we all have battles. They might seem silly. Like, I even thought before doing this, like, oh, I have to mention this time when I was a kid when people didn't want to be friends with me anymore. <laughs> like, are you serious? That, that, nobody wants to hear that. That's so silly. But then I think about it, and I'm like, no, that's a time I really felt alone. That's a time that really hurt me. Yeah. And, like, yeah. So with whatever healing, whatever brokenness that you have, just be brave and know that God is with you fighting those battles. Um, and like Taylor said, the community and stuff is really huge. But, yeah, our Savior just, like, desires to be with us in those moments. And he will be with us. Even if you don't think he can or will, you don't even know what that looks like. Just Look into your brokenness and really just invite God into those spaces is my advice because it's been life changing for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't ever even know it could come. So it's really mm-hmm. powerful. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much again for sharing. Like I said with Matt, it's it's not easy to get up here and do this. Um, I know as we were counting down the minutes till it was time to go. I'm sure there's a lot of, of pressure, but I, I appreciate just like I did with Justin doing the Mind of Christ series and Zach, like you know, that, that freedom begets freedom. You know, that when we uh, express some freedom that we've received in Christ, it, it, it whets other people's appetite for that in their own life. I mean, so those of you that are that are home maybe now in a marriage that feels kind of stuck and in, in relational patterns that um, are broken and you can't see a way through, um, just take hope from their story. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to talk to you as well and, and share one of the things that was really sticking out to me um, from what they said is we, we've talked about um, this idea Justin said at the end of his sermon series that it, like, our, our um, uh, uh, healing is our responsibility. Like our healing is our responsibility. It's not even our spouse's responsibility. Um, because as they were sharing, like Blair didn't understand the depth of the hurt and the pain from those wounds. And 
as she began to understand, as Taylor began to understand those things through counseling, he was then able to connect the dots for her. Otherwise, you know, she doesn't have all the information or, you know, vice versa. Um, the, the, the other person, the spouse, the friend or whatever is left kind of trying to play like mind reader, trying to figure out why when I do this, does it elicit this emotion and this response? Like it doesn't seem to, to add up. Um, so as we take our own healing seriously, and we begin to be able to connect some dots of like, oh man, that happened, and that's why I respond the way I do. And we can begin sharing that with other people. Man, what a benefit that is for them to know that, because then that amplifies, hopefully, compassion and grace that they can have in those moments. And they can even come alongside us and remind us like, hey, I know you're just doing that because this happened and you're feeling shame or whatever the emotion might be. You want to attach to that. And um, man, that's not true about you. You don't have to feel that way. I'm going to love you. Um, I'm going to be with you through this. We're going to get together. But if you don't know those things, it is. You just get stuck in those crazy cycles. And so I just want to encourage you guys. Like, like I said a couple weeks ago, I'm so encouraged because so many folks in our church are taking their healing seriously and making some significant strides um, to move towards health. And man, as, as everybody on the stage here today, except for me, um, is in their 20s, late 20s, you know, just learning this stuff at such a young age um, is so powerful, guys. It sets you guys up for a lifetime of of not only your own health and your relationship, but your ability to come alongside others and to speak truth into their life and speak grace. Um, your, the ministry that you can have because of your self-awareness, um, it just amplifies and multiplies. And so, um, and God wants to do that, right? He wants to take the seeds that are planted and he wants to create this harvest that is a hundred times, a hundredfold what you can imagine. So as much as Blair didn't know what, couldn't even imagine what today could look like a year ago, she has no idea 10 years down the road how God is going to use this season in their life to benefit so many other folks. And, and that can be your story as well. So thank you guys for hanging in there with us. I know we went a little, little bit longer than we normally do, but we really felt like, um, you know, we've got to attach these things we're learning with stories of transformation to make it really real. So I would love to hear any stories that you have. You can email me, let me know. That encourages my heart so much to know what you're learning and how you're growing. Um, and uh, Hang in there. Uh, hopefully things are going to be starting to get back to normal here soon. Um, we love you guys. Let us know again if you guys have any needs as we have money coming in, hopefully to address um, some emergency needs families might have. If you know of somebody that could really use just a boost financially to pay for a car repair or groceries for their kids, whatever it might be, guys, we want to be known as a church that just stepped up in generosity during this time. So keep us informed on those things as you know people that have needs. And I'm going to pray to close us out this morning. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. What a gift and blessing this time has been for everyone involved here, Lord. You are mighty, God. And um, Lord, we just are so grateful that, um, just getting back to the language um, from the book, the sermon series, that you were on, um, you know, the side of our sin with us. And you're standing here arm in arm with us, and you see our pile of junk <laughs> And you see, like we talked about, the dump trucks of our junk 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. And you're not surprised by any of it because you're a God that sees everything. Nor are you frustrated or disappointed in us. But you're committed to loving us, to empowering us, um, to head in that stuff. And you've already paid for it all. You know, Christ said on the cross, man, it is finished. All this stuff has been paid for. Um, now it's just a process of, of becoming more like Christ and kind of unpacking some things to help us to love better here on the time that we have on this earth until we are once and for all perfect in your eyes um, with you. And so thank you for this time, God. Use it, multiply it, encourage people today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you.